space is not rich enough to support life. Uh, so we have a natural explanation, if we believe this, uh, for why we expect to find ourselves in such a, uh, an unusual place. Uh, and it's not based on divine providence, it's based on environmental selection. Uh, we think that living things could only be here, uh, places like here. Uh, so, uh, as early as 1987, uh, Steve Weinberg, author of the famous book, The First Three Minutes, uh, and other famous books as well, uh, pointed out uh, that the cosmological constant might be explained the same way. Uh, the idea would be that maybe the cosmological constant really is huge in most pocket universes, um, but nonetheless, um, we have to remember that the cosmological constant does affect the way life might evolve. Uh, in particular, the cosmological constant uh, causes the universe uh, to accelerate in its expansion. That's what it was introduced for in the first place. Uh, if the cosmological constant is negative, it causes negative acceleration, inward acceleration, and the universe very quickly collapses. And certainly if you had too large a negative cosmological constant, uh, it would certainly cause the universe to collapse too fast for life that looks like us to evolve. Uh, in applying this principle, you're kind of making the assumptions that all the kinds of life that might exist in the universe are not too different from us. And that's certainly one of the difficulties of uh, being convinced about this. Uh, but it's easy to be convinced that we could not live if the cosmological constant were significantly negative. Uh, and we'll consider that therefore maybe no life would exist if the cosmological constant were significantly negative. Co similarly, if the cosmological constant is large and positive, say more than 100 or 1,000 times larger than what we observe, uh, then the universe would fly apart very quickly because of the repulsive force of the cosmological constant. Uh, and then again, life like us could certainly not form, and you might assume that no life could form. And if that's the case, uh, then life can only form where the cosmological constant is very small, and it's the same as the mass density was before. Life only forms where the mass density is high, and only forms when the cosmological constant is very small. So, of course, that's what we see, even though throughout the universe or throughout the multiverse, those conditions might be very rare. Uh, and in 1998, Martel, Shapiro, and Weinberg did more serious work on this, trying to really calculate what happens. Uh, and they decided that within about a factor of five or so, the cosmological constant had better be what it is, or else uh, life could not form. What they're really looking at is the formation of galaxies. Uh, galaxies could not form unless the cosmological constant is within about a factor of five of, of what we see. And therefore, this huge range, up going up to 120 orders of magnitude larger uh, than what we observe, which is what the theory predicts, uh, the idea would be that pocket universes like that exist, they even dominate, but they're lifeless, so we don't expect to find ourselves there. Uh, this is controversial, as you might guess. Um, a number of physicists regard these anthropic arguments as total nonsense. That's not physics, that's not the way physics works. I don't know. Uh, my, my opinion is, is that this anthropic explanation is probably best taken as, as a last resort. Um, I think until we actually understand the landscape and understand more about life, uh, this idea that life can only form where the cosmological constant is small is something we don't really know. Uh, the best we can do is argue that it's plausible. Uh, so I think anthropic arguments are at best plausible and, hard, and never completely convincing. Um, and I think, therefore, they only become attractive when you can't find any better explanation. <laughs> and that's what I mean by the explanation of last resort. Uh, and topic arguments I might mention have been used for other things in physics like the mass of the Higgs particle, the mass of the top quark, uh, the magnitude of the density perturbations, and the end of inflation, things like that. Uh, and uh, it's become sort of an industry to think about these things now, but uh, nobody's quite sure how seriously to take all this. Uh, so the question then is, is it time to accept this explanation of last resort uh, for the cosmological constant? Uh, and all I can tell you is that uh, your guess is that <laughs> mine. I, don't know. Uh, I, I think it is a possible explanation, uh, but uh, and I also would say that's the best explanation we have at present. Uh, but whether or not we should continue to, whether or not we can realistically hope for a better explanation to come about soon, it's hard to tell. So I don't really know. Uh, so for the cosmological constant, uh, my statement is that it uh, seems so hard to explain any other way. I think we do need to take the selection effect idea seriously, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean it, it really is right. Uh, it is a disappointment uh, from the point of view of, of theoretical physicists. Um, in earlier years, there was a widespread hope uh, that eventually string theory would be able to allow us to explain everything, 
we'd be able, for example, to calculate things like the charge of an electron, the mass of a quark, and all the basic parameters of the standard model of particle physics, which right now we just take as, as given values that are determined by experiment. We have no idea what determines these basic constants. So we always hoped uh, that maybe string theory would tell us how to calculate them all. There are about 20 or so free parameters uh, in our underlying theory of nature. Um, but if these landscape picture is correct, then all of these values are really just historical accidents. It's just a feature of the vacuum that we happen to be living in, and we'll never be able to calculate it. It's just like the, you know, trying to calculate what the weather is going to be from first principles. It would be different every time. There's, there's no button that determines what it has to be. Um, people do point out frequently that th this is not the first time that uh, science has come up with exactly this kind of a situation. If you can think back to the time of Kepler, uh, Kepler tried very seriously to calculate the ratios of the radii of the orbits of the planets. You might recall these building models of nested solids inside of nested mm -hmm. solids. Uh, and that was because to him, the radii of the planets was fundamental science and should have a fundamental explanation. Uh, and he was out to seek it. Uh, he didn't fool himself. He realized that his nested regular solids never quite worked. Uh, but that was the goal, to try to find a fundamental theory uh, for the radii of the planets. Uh, now we regard the radii of the planets as being just an environmental effect. They just happen to be what they are in our solar system, and other solar systems will be different. Uh, we no longer think that the radius of the orbit of the Earth is some fundamental piece of physics that we should be able to calculate from first principles. Uh, so if these ideas about the entropic principle are right, it would mean that the cosmological constant is in the same boat as the radius of the Earth's orbit, and perhaps even all the other constants, like the charge and mass of an electron, uh, are similar, determined simply by environmental effects uh, and not by any fundamental physics. Uh, so I'll stop there. I'll just show you my... Uh, I'm going to skip over a few slides because I give you a bit. But the bottom line is that we've never had a model of the universe that works so well. Uh, we really can calculate things very accurately. Uh, but at the same time, it's incredibly mysterious. Uh, we just don't understand what this dark energy is, and we really have to strain uh, to come up with uh, stories about the cosmological constant uh, that sound at all plausible. I'll stop there. Thank you. May the force be with you. <laughs> Thank you very much. If there's any questions, uh, given the time, you might want to just come up and uh, speak a few moments to Professor Guth. But uh, I know some people, it's after 10, so some of us have to take I would think that uh, the, this uh, mystery that you end up with would leave a lot of uh, scope for uh, theologians. Uh, for you better believe it. <laughs> That's one of the difficulties in working in cosmology. Uh, one gets a lot of email from that. Or even serious theologians. Yeah, even serious theologians, you're right.